It's like when you're going to high school and you feel so dumb when you're a freshman. And then when you're a senior, you feel so cool. And then you graduate from high school and you go to college and you feel like an idiot again. It's normal. Yep. And growth means at some point you're at the bottom of the ladder again. It's normal. It's good. Yeah, I think school's a big one. Everyone's gone through that. I mean, you go through that when you're a child even. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Fascinating Womanhood channel, where we talk about all things that have to do with femininity and building strong, long-lasting, loving relationships. I am Cherry Lynn, and I am here with my mom, Dixie Andalyn Forsyth. Hi. Hi. So we are here today to talk about imposter syndrome. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this. It's a really common topic. You probably can Google it and find dozens beyond dozens of different articles and videos about it. But we wanted to talk about it today, specifically how it relates to women. Imposter syndrome obviously applies to men and women. Right. Inadequacy in a way is inadequacy. But I do think there's something to be said about women going through it a little bit more than men personally. Mm -hmm. as mothers. And we've seen a lot of it in our Facebook community. We've heard a lot of ladies say things along the lines of, I'm trying to improve upon myself. I'm trying to rediscover my femininity and I feel inadequate. I feel strange. This doesn't feel natural to me, things like that. Um, I've also heard it from mothers. We just wanted to touch on how it relates to females more because there isn't a lot of discussion about what women are going through with imposter syndrome. We're going to discuss three ways mm -hmm. to kind of overcome uh, the imposter syndrome. But before we get into the three ways, we want to talk a little bit about what it really means, what we think it means, mm -hmm. um, because we've obviously experienced it many, many times, both of yeah. us have. And I'm sure most of you out there have too. So what, it, what do you think it means? I think you said it really well when you said it's when you feel you're doing something new, learning something new, and you start to feel fake, like this isn't really me kind of a feeling. And it's normal to feel that way. What's the difference do you think between feeling fearful and feeling imposter syndrome? I think there's overlap. There's overlap partly because when you're learning something new, like for some ladies exploring their femininity, anything <laughs> new has an element of fear. Anything you're learning that's new, even if it's something you want to learn, the fear partly comes <laughs> in, what if I can't do this? What if I'm not good at it? And then there's the, the imposter thing, which is feeling like this doesn't feel like me. But there's a there's a line in a movie that I really liked. It's uh, Hitch. Some of you may have seen it. Mm -hmm. where the, the Hitch character played by Will Smith says to this guy he's coaching, he said, you is a very fluid concept right now. You is a very fluid concept right now. You bought the shoes. You look great in the shoes. That's the you that I'm talking about. Which I think is true of all of us, even at my age, fluid in many respects, in that we can decide I'm going to get more comfortable with public speaking. And mm -hmm. you can actually do that. Now, it isn't instant, but you can actually be good at that and start to feel comfortable, but you don't begin feeling comfortable. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. So the fear is definitely a part of it. What about anxiety? Do you think that's a part of imposter syndrome? Yeah. Anxiety is a, a subset of fear anyway. Mm -hmm. Anxiety as again, it points back to, I want to do a good job. I want to be good at this and feeling like, what if I don't? And of course we all know those of us who've read timeless, what if comes in the downstairs? That's all those downstairs feelings, but it doesn't mean that you're on the right track. In fact, imposter syndrome, I'm kind of excited about because when you're feeling that, that's normal to feel that way. It's good to feel that way because it means you're doing something that's going to make you uh, learn. Right. I think what we're trying to say here uh, is that, you know, not only identifying what it is, because I think sometimes we are not really aware that we're going through it. So it's important to go through each one of these and say, you're probably going through imposter syndrome because right. you feel anxiety, you feel fear, you feel inadequate, you know, that's probably what's going on. But then after you identify it, you can say, but this is healthy. It is healthy. Right. Imposter syndrome. And that's the bottom line of this whole 
video we're doing, imposter syndrome is healthy. Just don't give, don't, don't say, well, therefore I've got to quit. It's, it's a, it's a good sign. We read somewhere, I don't know how accurate this is, but I, we did read when we were researching for this video that more than 70% of the population has admitted to going through imposter syndrome. So basically that's everybody. So yeah, everyone's going everybody, through this. Everybody who's not kind of dishonest with themselves is, I mean, I mean, Bob would probably say a few, a few narcissistic patients would say, no, I, you know, but most of us, yeah, we go through it regularly because we're constantly trying to improve. Um, another great example for all the ladies out there that are visual learners and they want to see this. Uh, we recently watched Catch Me If You Can, that movie with Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio and we were discussing it Dixie and I were discussing how interesting that movie is to watch as it relates to imposter syndrome because it's a story it's a true story um if you haven't seen it I won't spoil it but it's a true story about a <coughs> teenager basically he lies he lies uh his way into all these different professions my name is Frank Taylor I'm a co-pilot for Pan Am I'm a doctor I sort of am a lawyer now <laughs> But he doesn't feel imposter syndrome. Uh, and they don't talk about that in the movie. We just identified it when we watched it. But isn't it interesting what happens when you don't experience imposter syndrome? It would have helped him if he, he felt it more. Yeah. And if you want to go watch it, it's a really good movie. And it's really interesting. It's a great example of reminding yourself that imposter syndrome is very healthy. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I wish so, so much that the main uh, character in the movie had felt it because he would not have gone yeah. to jail. Yeah. But that, if you want a visual example, that's a really great one to watch. He doesn't actually have it there. I think there's moments in the movie where he actually does yeah. feel it, but he charges through and he kind of, yeah. he kind of just squashes it yeah. in a way and it gets him into trouble. So that's gets just, into, yeah, it gets him into significant trouble. And I have a feeling his trouble was a little more than they showed in the movie because who wants to see all that? Right. You know, he came through it and he's, they say in the end what he's doing now and it's kind of not the real guy. Wait. Yeah. But what's interesting is to look at why we feel that way or why does it happen it comes from self-doubt is one of them which uh, a lot of us have self-doubt perfectionism i'm definitely guilty of that i tend to like things to be right a lot of you know I, I like doing art when you're an artist or any kind of an artist whether it's in baking or drawing or anything it seems like nothing is ever very good it's you're never good enough you look back at it and on the day you finish you think oh this is pretty good and then a week later you think oh, i could have done that better it's perfectionism and realizing I'm not that great. Uh, lowered self-esteem, which a lot of us struggle with that from time to time. And the last one I put down is just simply being naive about the way it should be when you're learning something new. Because we all have to go through learning curves. Certainly, you know, I learned to make a bed so long ago, I don't remember doing it, but I'm glad I learned. You know, you, you get you get better and you get more comfortable so that making a bed is like part of you. And everything has to, for something to be you, you have to incorporate it into your life. It isn't just automatically you. Mm -hmm. An example I thought of was, um, a lot of you have only seen me as a blonde, but I was born blonde. And then when I was a little girl, my hair turned brown. And when I was a teenager... I really got into dark hair, so I dyed my hair dark instead of brown. And it was dark till, I don't know, in my, till I was 50. And then I decided, I'll share a little secret. I started to get some gray hair and I thought, uh-oh, it's going to be hard to keep this up with the dark hair, so I went blonde. Okay, so when I first did my hair blonde and I went outside, I felt like such an imposter. I felt like people were staring at me. Mm -hmm. Now, in reality, they weren't. But looking, but we all know that feeling of either you change your hairstyle, you cut it, or you do something and you feel like everyone's staring at you. Mm -hmm. Feeling that way doesn't mean that they actually are, but it feels that way. So that's a type of imposter syndrome that you can feel just on a normal, all you did was change your hair color. I think that's a really great example of the more light, lighter side of imposter syndrome. I think that's a really great way of explaining it. You know, and we, like I said earlier, we've both been through it so many times. I've been through this so many times. Um, but the one that stands out to me, that's a little bit more like a tougher, tougher time right. was when I first had my first baby. I don't think I've ever told you this. I had a really, really hard time when I 
first delivered my baby. I thought this is going to be so magical. I thought I'm so excited to be a mom. And I thought, you know, as soon as I get my baby, everything's just going to be so amazing. You know, I'm sure a lot of moms feel that way when they're having a baby for the first time, but I didn't feel that way. I felt, I mean, I loved my baby, but I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified of being a new mom. I was afraid of making mistakes. I felt like everything was so new and I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I'm fascinated by women that say they don't feel that way when they first have a baby. And it's just, it is kind of, in a sense, kind of magical for some women and they don't feel that way. But I felt imposter syndrome so deeply to the point of, I couldn't even bond with my baby. It took me several months to bond with my first baby because I just felt And I feel so selfish even saying that I, you know, I felt really inadequate and I felt like when's everybody going to find out that I can't do this. And it's, and I, you know, part of it, it had to do with hormones and, you know, we can get into all that stuff. It's a whole other story, but I think the bottom line is it, it it really was, like you said, very healthy for me to feel that way. And I didn't know that at the time, I just felt like I was doing a bad job and Mm -hmm. It, it consumed me to the point where I couldn't eat. It was very, very difficult. And I lost 70 or 80 pounds in a few months. It was really tough. And now I look back at that time and I know exactly why I felt that way is because I had, mm-hmm. I had to grow and I was really naive about how hard it was. I've got to say, I was up there helping you the first week or so and I could feel it. I could tell. And I felt bad. I I tried to help out, but I knew that there's only so much I could do. And then you had to go through it. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. It was very difficult. My hardest one was my third because I thought, Mm -hmm. oh no, what do I do if they all cry at once? You know, it was, it was. You didn't feel imposter syndrome with your first baby? I felt like my youth was gone. It was different. But, but that's, that's not what I'm saying. No, I didn't feel that. I just felt like. No, because I was an oldest daughter. I, I taken you're a youngest. I had taken care of my younger brothers and sisters. I, I had a lot more experience with babies than you did. But I felt like <laughs> felt like I have to get up in the night. See, I was twenty. You didn't have imposter syndrome. You no, just had, I had I had, had uh, other things. I had my youth is gone syndrome. And for some women, it's their third baby or their fourth baby or whatever. It isn't always the first. Because some, some babies just sleep all the time and make it a real easy transition, but some babies don't. Well, well don't you think it's common to feel that way when you start a new job? It yeah. is. And the only reason why I share the mom story is because I think, you know, you do find videos out there with imposter syndrome on men and careers and women in careers. And I think that's all very, very important, but you don't, there's not a lot of women talking about this. There's not a lot of women talking about their struggles with this outside of the workforce. I think there are a lot of really great conversations about this with work. And I think that's great. And I've actually gone through it with work. Um, and that's probably why I felt that way as a new mom, because I was a worker worker. I was working my whole pregnancy. I was a career person and then I became a mom. So I think that's an important part of that story is like, like I went from being a full-time worker to being a mom at home. And I just didn't know how to do it. And I was terrified to do it. And I kind of wanted to go back to work because I just felt so strange. Well, Um, some of you, it may be surprising to some, but when I kind of inherited fascinating womanhood, I say that carefully because there's four of us sisters. None of us ever talked about what we do when our mother died. So when it fell into my lap, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do it. And I've thought so many times, well, I wish you, I wish I could ask her uh, what she did about this or what she did about that. And of course I can't, I, I would like to have asked her how she felt uh, about some of the things she did or how she handled different situations. Or syndrome. And so now what I want to bring out about women is because we tend to be the relationship oriented people that we are, we're more sensitive and sensitivity makes you more vulnerable. It's a great advantage. But it has some some areas of um, vulnerability, and that's one of them. But if you can just realize imposter syndrome means, oh, here's something I doing I am doing that's going to allow me to gain a new skill to grow, and I won't always feel this way. One of the ladies 
wrote that when she started to dress more feminine, when she went out to stores and things, and she felt like everyone was staring at her. He's staring at me. Staring at you? Yeah, I think that's sweet. Sweet, I think it's kind of strange. That's why I thought of the hair color thing, because I thought, yeah, I know exactly what that feels like. You feel like everybody's staring at me. In reality, they probably aren't, but it feels like it. And even if they are, they might just think you look great. That's that's a really good point, is the bringing up of the, well, everyone's staring at me, so I'm not going to do this. No, you're, you're on to something good. You're just not used to it. Yeah, yeah. Women tend to feel it real often because of our sensitivity. I don't think that it's fair to say that men don't go through it and they're not sensitive. I think it's just more accurate to say that I think men share more stories about imposter syndrome as it relates to careers, right. um, just development goals, which is great. And I think that's a huge part of imposter syndrome, but I just, I think there needs to be more discussion about what women go through, especially the ones that we hear from all the time that they're trying to be yeah. more feminine, trying to be good moms, even housekeeping. Someone yeah. messaged me yesterday talking about how she's not natural with being, you know, the domestic side of her life. She never was taught any of those things. And she's kind of terrified of yeah. it. Yeah. She's starting to do it. And she's like, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's imposter syndrome too. It is. It is. I think when we talk about men, I think about uh, Bob and he never talks about imposter syndrome. What yeah. I know he's felt it. The way he tends to approach it is if he feels like something doesn't feel natural, then it's a task and a challenge for him to succeed at because he's so task oriented. He, it, it's like, okay, I don't feel like I fit here. So I'm going to do this until it does. We were in a financial bind. It's a long story. And he started working at this hospital. He he basically told them, didn't tell them, but they thought that he had a lot of experience in this one area. He didn't really, had very little. But he he took home a stack of books and said, you know, I'm going to read all these books over this weekend and they will never know that I didn't know. It was a challenge to him. I would have just been terrified. I think that's a really good example of how, you know, some men, not all men, but some men might... Up might react to imposter syndrome a little bit more as a target. More often, women we worry about we, it. Yeah. Relationship part yeah. of us and the sensitivity in, in us, we just kind of feel like we are crumbling a little bit more, yeah. and it's and it's difficult. I mean, depends yeah. on the personality of the woman, but so we're gonna go into three ways that you can overcome. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't go through it, and this is you know pew pew like yeah. <laughs> smash it down. It just means how you can, you identify that you're going through imposter syndrome. What can you do to make life a little more pleasant? I guess. I don't know if you want well, to say that. Why number not? one, the first one, and we've already been talking about it is embrace the uncomfortable. Realize this is healthy. That is going to be half of your battle right there. You think, ah, okay, I'm feeling this is a good thing instead of, oh no. I think part of embracing it too is talking about it. Right. Who Which we're you, good at. Who can you go to to talk to about this? I know when I was going through it as a new mom, I called you because <laughs> I was terrified and you helped me. No, this is not going to last that long. This is not going to let you know. And you gave me all of the things that I needed to hear. And it made me feel so much better. Being able to verbalize how I felt really helped me. And I wish that I could have done so many more things different. I wish I knew more then that I know now, but I know that that was one thing that was my lifeline was I was on the phone all the time with different men talking and trying to get it out. And every single one of them basically said the same thing. You're going to be fine. You know, and you know, um, you young girls now have what I didn't have. There's online groups. If you don't have a friend or a mother, we didn't have that then either. Yeah. But now we are, there's support groups, which is amazing and and helpful. And And, okay. (laughs) The second second idea is develop a healthy response to feeling kind of low. You know, ladies, we have periods, we have emotional, biological highs and lows more than men. We have times of the month and after baby blues and, and some of these things that are hormonally charged. So developing a healthy response to some of those feelings can really help you and maybe give yourself a break now and then. Mm-hmm. Self-care. Self-care is, is really important. If you've just had a baby and you're feeling low, it might be hormonal. 
in which case it won't last. And during the time that it does, be a little more aware of self-care and just allowing yourself, okay, being kind to yourself. As it relates to a career, if you have imposter syndrome with a new job, developing a healthy response for me when I've gone through that with work has been so much education for myself, self-improvement. So when I felt at a, at a job, when I switched jobs and I had a new job, I did everything I could, buried myself in information as to how to do that new job the best that I possibly could. I think that was my healthy response. And it's different for everyone. That's yeah. also that's also part of the third one, which is getting more in touch with your goals. It kind of leads into it. It isn't so much it. The third one is getting in touch with your goals or learning to visualize your success instead of dwelling on the imposter syndrome, work on the goal that you have that you're already in, which is why you're feeling it in the first place. Maybe keep a list of some of your accomplishments, the things you've done right. For Let's take, for example, femininity it can be about other things that you've done that you've been good at or successful at. Pull those things out when you're feeling low. Maybe write it down. For a lot of us, we have to visually see it. For me, if I'm feeling low, it's hard for me to remember any of my good qualities. So if, I've, if you've written it down, then you can go look at it and remind yourself. Whenever you're stressed out, I'm sure most of you out there would agree, it feels horrible when you're stressed to do nothing. To just yeah. well in the stress is terrible. It's the worst feeling to just sit it there is. and go, well, I'm stressed and I don't know what to do. Well, you've got to find something that you can do, even if it's tiny, to help you to feel like you're moving and you're getting somewhere. And I love that idea of making a list because at least that's something that anyone can do. What are some things that I've done well? And what are some things I want to do and I want to accomplish? And it will help you to yeah. feel like you're moving and by the way, do the list when you're feeling good. Yeah. <laughs> Not when you're, feel when you're yeah. feeling like, yeah, I just did this. I did a pretty good job. This recipe I tried really turned out well. You took a picture of it. Write it down. And yeah. feeling uncomfortable while you're growing is okay. It's like when you're going to high school and you feel so dumb when you're a freshman. And then when you're a senior, you feel so cool. And then you graduate from high school <laughs> and you go to college and you feel like an idiot again. It's normal. Yeah. Growth means at some point you're at the bottom of the ladder again. It's normal. It's good. Yeah, no, that's a good that's a good point about school. Yeah, I think school's a big one. Everyone's gone through that. I mean, you go through that when you're a child even. And there's an there's another thing to remember that you can you can read about something, like you can read timeless and you can know something. You can say, you know what? That's true. Uh, this is what I want to be. Knowing something and incorporating that and doing it into your life are two separate things. And Bob is the one who taught me this, that it, it takes a long time. And I'm not going to say a length of time because it's different for different things and different people. It takes a long time to incorporate what you know into behavior. And you have to give yourself time to change because you think, well, I already read this. I know it's true. I believe this. So why am I struggling with this? Because behavior is different than knowledge. You, ha well, you have to develop habits and brain wiring in your... Exactly. And everyone has such a different situation. And, and practice. You need to practice. It's just like playing the piano. You can understand intellectually and you know where to put your hands on the keys. But actually being good at piano takes practice. There's no other substitute for those, those uh, networks, to, those learning networks in your brain to actually make it part of you. Give yourself a break and realize I can know something, but don't be hard on yourself when it isn't instantly translated into behavior. I feel like we could talk about this all day. Yeah. This is a really interesting subject, and I'm really glad that we were able to talk about it. Um, we would love to hear your stories of imposter syndrome down below if you want to your share. imposter stories. This has been really, really great discussion. Thank you so much for being here. And for everyone watching, if you haven't read Dixie's book, Fascinating Womanhood for the Timeless Woman, you should definitely pick up a copy. I'm going to attach a link below for all the places that you can purchase it. She yeah. also has a workbook that goes along with it that will be posted down below. And all the places that you can find us on social media will all be attached down below. We also have a brand new book that I will attach a link to in the video. It's called My Love, The Love Journal. So you should definitely check that out if you haven't seen it yet. And we're here every week. So don't forget to check back with us. And we will see you next time. Bye. Take care, everybody.